you're starting. Oh boy, here we go. Welcome to Hey Time. There it is. Welcome back to another Hey Time. We're excited to see each of you here as y'all are flooding in rapidly to uh, hang out. Uh, see Andy Piper. There you go. What's up, Mr. Piper? Ooh. Happy New Year. There you go. We were just remarking that uh, at least some of us got uh, some snow. Uh, we got like this much snow. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was like we, you had like a five minute snowball fight, and that was about it. Oh, wow. Really? We, I'm in Woodstock. We got a good bit. It just it didn't stick on the ground, which was like the perfect mix of beautiful white and no treacherous driving. I felt the same way on the south side. It was just like a little, I mean, you couldn't see hardly any on the ground. It wasn't sticking, but it was really pretty just coming down. It was gorgeous. On the west side, we got about six inches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the west side of what? When you say west side. <laughs> The west yeah, side of Colorado, guys. <laughs> side of the country? I don't know. That was pretty good. <laughs> um, and yeah, some folks had enough snow for snowball fights. Look at that. Hi. Looks we got a lot of folks jumping in here. Um, yeah, so apparently there's some call for snow and my son for tomorrow. And my son's already like, we're not gonna have school. I'm like, that's not how it works. There might be snow yeah i've been hearing it's pretty likely tomorrow so we'll see oh really for you okay well yeah I'm paying attention. i i kind of still despite what happened in 2014 i uh still snicker at the sound <laughs> yeah no i get it <laughs> so uh speaking of that's eight days away so the 28th of january in 2014 where were you on snowpocalypse Oh, oh we yeah, whole another segment. So we should probably get started with tablet. <laughs> well, the, the, so we had just had our uh, my second kid. He was three days old. So we were at home. But we are good friends with the folks. I don't know. Some of y'all have been in Atlanta for a while. We'll know this story. There was a, a baby born on the side of 285 in between. Yeah, yeah uh, like Ashford Dunwoody Springs. And like they go to our church and uh like we know that kid, we know that family well. Like it's like it's funny because like of course they're you know a couple days apart, and uh, she has obviously no recollection. But they had two older daughters that watched that whole thing happen. I think they're gonna be nuns. So. Wow. Well, I was My husband spent pregnant. that night on two eighty five, like overnight. Uh, yeah. That's so awesome. he remembers it well. Mm -hmm. I was six months pregnant and we weren't allowed to leave school because I was still a teacher at Etowah at the time. And so I had to wait to other kids, the kids left before I was able to go. And by that time I looked outside and went, yeah, this is not a good idea. So I just stayed. Yeah. Yeah. I get yeah, that. I was, I was working in perimeter and living in Smyrna. And so it was like a, I don't know, 10 mile drive and my little electric car did its best to make it through the snow, but I barely made it home. <laughs> <laughs> We got uh, on the chat, Rich is saying he was at the Weather Channel. I bet that was a, uh, a happening place to be. Wow, there. yeah. Front row seat. Yeah, right. no kidding. Jeez. All right. Lead us. So today's agenda. Here's a look at what's happening today. We're happy everybody's here. We'll start off with just some announcements, and then we have two excellent speakers. And... One thing I know I was supposed to mention um, while we are here on this slide, if, if there's anyone hiring, um, if there are any positions open where you're working, if you could maybe drop them in the chat. I know of a few ATUG folks who um, have some positions open and would love to fill them and us not being together in person, we used to always do that at meetings. So if you're looking for a role, if you have a job to fill, um, Feel free to add anything in the chat now, and that's a great way to connect with folks. There you go. All right. Iron Viz. Are y'all excited? Coming up. So this looks like um, we've got just a short window here to, to participate in the theater contest, and this is visualizing the arts. Do you know more about the theme, Karen? I, I don't know more than that. 
All I know is visualizing the arts. But for those of you who are wondering, like, it feels like we just had Iron Viz. Why is there another one? Just a reminder, it's um, Tableau Conference is going to be earlier this year. For, so for 2022, they haven't announced dates. And we're not sure when it will be. But like hearing rumors of like Mayish, June-ish, you know, so it'll be a lot earlier than it was last year. So to prepare, they need to have the qualifying contest like now. So mm -hmm. it is ongoing. Is anyone participating? If so, feel free to add to the chat because um, we'd love to know. Um, but you still have plenty of time. If you haven't started yet, there's still plenty of time um, to participate. You just have to have it submitted by the 7th. And, and right. I added on, on there the these live events here that for the US, it's January 24th, I have it on there. Um, it's, it says 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm going, okay, well, that's early our time. There's also, if you want the other side of that, there's also a January 25th um, Asia Singapore time, which I think that's going to be even harder to do. But um, there, we'll throw the link in chat if we didn't already. And that's a great way. It's live. It's a great way to learn how to um, work with Iron Viz. And they actually have a Q&A that they're going to answer. Uh, Sarah Bartlett that was on with us just, gosh, was that a couple months ago, the last one? I, all the months run together. Mm -hmm. She is running it, um, Tableau Zen Master, and she's running this. And so along with Lisa Trescott, who won last year, and Pradeep Kumar, who is also a finalist from last year. Yes, and the last bullet on here, you may have noticed there was a um, post about this on LinkedIn, but if you're particularly passionate, interested in diversity, equity, inclusion, Tableau is looking for folks to join their community equity task force. And so they're accepting applications if you're interested to get involved, just like get to know other people in the data fam. Um, if you, if we have a link, we'll put it, add it to the chat, but otherwise check out um, LinkedIn. There's a, a link out there if that is something you're interested in. There's some links in chat now, so you should be able to- Okay, it. Per perfect. And upcoming meetings. So we have our next meeting will be um, in a few weeks, end of February, February 24th. And we will be hearing from Nicole and Juana. And I'm not sure if you guys are on this call, but for those who uh, maybe haven't met Nicole and Juana yet, they were, <laughs> our, yes, they were our ATL Iron Viz winners last year. I should have added a slide with like their Viz. Mm -hmm. um, well done. It was really cool. And since then, they have really been putting out a lot of great work on Tableau Public. And one of their um, the dashboards they built, it was a collaboration. The two of them worked together again. It won Viz of the Day. Um, and I believe it was like recognized. I think they did it for like Viz for Social Good or one of those projects. Um, so anyway, they're going to share how they built that viz. And then they're also just going to talk about like collaborating in Tableau and like working on something with other people and kind of what they've learned through that type of experience. And, and, and Nicole actually has a great uh, blog post on it. Am I, it would be a spoiler to, to share that. I want to kind of share no, that. I, she does. Gonna, and I think she, I'm she sharing it. kicked something off, like a new project about like trying to help people find others who might want to collaborate um, and create Tableau public work with someone else in the data fam. So perhaps she'll talk some about that as well. Um, but for those of you who, who aren't aware, we do have a dashboard for ATUG with all of these key dates, like the dates upcoming for the rest of the year that we're planning meetings for. You can see a lot of them are in red. Um, if you are interested in speaking, we need speakers and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so if you're interested in speaking, if you have a presentation that you'd like to, anything you'd like to share, please let us know, reach out and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, we are excited. We have two fantastic presenters for you today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first one to you. Uh, so we've got Jade Limpy, who's gonna be joining us. She is uh, a three-time Visit the Day winner, um, but Jade is a rock star in the Tableau space. Uh, and one of the things that you'll get to experience with Jade very shortly is uh, kind of her bubbly nature, the joy she brings, 
Uh, she loves to engage with people. And what we're gonna be talking about today is like, how do you engage with people in a virtual world? Uh, and so here in our organization, we have fallen in love with this platform and tool called Miro. Uh, and so Jay's gonna be talking about what is that? How do you use it in order to create uh, awesome experiences and to ultimately build really awesome uh, analytic solutions through Tableau. And then Karen, you're gonna be introducing Paul. Yes, I feel like I don't even really need to. Um, Paul, feel free to turn your video on if you'd like. Everybody knows Paul, right? Um, for those that don't know Paul, he was, Paul Lisborg was a former ATUG leader, um, but he, although he's attended ATUG for, for a very long time, he wasn't an ATUG leader for long before going to work for Tableau. And then of course he had to pass the baton to us, but um, he is a senior principal customer success manager now at Tableau, and he will be speaking with us about date calculations in Tableau. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Paul. Hey guys. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. Jay, welcome to the platform. Start to the stage. The mic is yours. We are excited to learn from you. I'll go ahead and let you share your screen. Hey guys. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to be doing this. This is like such a huge honor. I never thought I'd be doing something like this. So super pumped. But all right. Can you guys see my screen? We see it. Cool. Okay. Um, thank you for the really sweet intro, Nelson. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Jade. I'm a senior viz analytics consultant with Analytic Vision, and um, I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. So not a Georgia person. I'm kind of just hanging out, mooching off y'all's A-tug because um, it's too much fun. But um, really, I'm like working my dream job now. And through this, I was introduced to Miro, and I realized how it, using Miro and Tableau together um, for an entire dashboard project can really just like help the analyst, help your client or your team uh, really communicate and work together. So I wanted to talk about from beginning to end what this looks like. So a quick overview. We're in the tool Miro right now, actually. Um, but I wanted to show you how I use Miro to work on a dashboard project from anywhere from discovery to the data sources, wireframing, um, overall project management and documentation. Um, quick warning, it is a little Tableau light, like I'm not going to be touching Tableau as much. We're going to be in more Miro world, but um, I really think it's a good way to communicate with your clients, have everybody be on the same page, um, and help the clients or team that you're working with see the vision that you have for your dashboard. Um, it enables a Tableau user to better use Tableau in a remote world. So. What is Tableau? What is Miro? I'm sure you guys all know what Tableau is. It's this awesome tool we get to use to visualize our data in reports to help users make better business decisions and solve problems. Um, and then Miro is an online collaborative whiteboarding tool. Um, you can, it's similar to a Google Doc. You know, you can have multiple people working on different aspects of it at the same time. So, let me do a quick walkthrough on Miro so you're not too overwhelmed. Basically, you have your canvas, which is this in the middle. You can do all kinds of stuff to it, and I'll show you in a little bit. But we have our main board menu where you can look at the project that it's in, your settings, alerts, you've got a search feature. You've got interactivity that you can do with the team, uh, people that are in here, um, with, as long as they have the link. You've got polls, you can do notes, there's an activity timer. Um, and you can also see who's in the dashboard now. Um, we got Nelson hanging out with me, thank you. Um, you're able to show reactions and just kind of, oh, hey, there he is. <laughs> um, just see who's here and share it with um, other people. And then we have our toolbar, which is the thing I use the most. Um, it'll look a little different for everyone and you can always customize it. But what it is, it has Miro's templates, um, frames, which is what you see the slide in, uh, sticky notes, you can do text, shapes, highlight, draw, all kinds of things like that. Um, we've got our navigation down here where you can zoom in and out, and then frames, comments, and slides down here. You can just kind of open and close that, but 
Um, all right. So now that you know the land, the land, no, that's a lot. Um, you can always go to Mira's website. They have tons of how-to videos and um, how to get started. But I was really surprised. The learning curve wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, I picked it up pretty quickly. And I think it's a really like easy tool to use. And I've found that um, our team and other clients, as we work with them with projects, they like using it too, which is the best part. So let me zoom out. This is the Mira, my Mira board's like entire canvas. We've got, you know, the intro, what we just went over, but here are all the other things we're going to tackle today. Like I said, for a dashboard project beginning to end. Um, so let's, I wanted to ask like, when you think about you're starting a brand new dashboard project, what are the struggles you experience um, when building your dashboard for the team, especially virtually? This could be going through status updates across disjointed email threads, um, remembering who your intended audience is. Oh, Nelson just added a good one. When you lose the dashboard link uh, in an email, it's in this string, you can't find it. They're like, can you send me a link again? Where's this at? That's super annoying. Um, putting together documentation. I have a guy on my team, he's wonderful, but he can't send documentation. So we're gonna talk about how to make that a little easier. Um, discovery and brainstorm session from the beginning. Or even, that's another one. For me, remembering, you know, what are the next to-do items on the dashboard based on feedback. So like, you know, maybe I've showed them a version one or two and I hear back from the team like, oh, let's change these things. But I, you know, keeping up with all that in a hard, can sometimes be hard. The struggle is real. <laughs> so I'm sure you guys experience pain points like this, maybe more, but this is, I'm gonna walk through how I use Miro to address all of these. So an example project to think about for this scenario is we have a worldwide company that would like us to help them visualize their global lease agreements to better understand their current locations, their employees, their square footage and their costs. Um, this is actually based off of my interview project for AV. So uh, I thought it was a good example to walk through. So. First thing you want to do is your dashboard discovery with your team, right? So dashboard, the discovery session is uh, typically the first step in a project where you work with the team to brainstorm, identify your vision, goals, audience, all of that. So I love using Mira for this because what I do beforehand is I kind of start out with a board and I add a table. That's what this is with my key categories. And before the meeting, I developed, like I created this table and then the black text is kind of questions I have or things based off maybe the SOW or just like conversations, Google searches I've had about the project, about the company that I know to be true. So key things you wanna hit is your audience. You know, who is the target, target audience for this dashboard? Why are they using it? Um, what are the questions that your audience is trying to answer? any key metrics that need to be a part of this. So we know that they want to see worldwide, right? So we need country, region, lease ID, employee counts, square footage. Um, all of the stuff in black is things that I thought about beforehand. Um, and then key features. Uh, some people want to be able to download summary data, you know, but then you've got the high level. We need to filter by country. We need to have these kind of things. Um, and then you can also kind of help guide the conversation for the desired UX or customer journey. Um, you know, do you want to start global and go down to lease view, that kind of thing. So when I'm, so beforehand, I put this together and then I send this mirror link to the team and we're able to walk through it and talk and people can add sticky notes to different locations. And, you know, we brainstorm these ideas together and it's a huge success. It really gets everybody on the same page. Um, so that, that's, this is the most like important part for me because I'm always able to reference back like, wait, did we want to show this? You know, I, I may not be aware of risk officers and why they would need to see something like this. So it's super helpful for me as an analyst. Um, so not only is Mira good for dashboard discovery, but we also have to think about our data source modeling. So Data modeling is basically creating a visual representation of your information systems and kind of how you want them to relate or what exists. And so again, for this project, um, this is 
not only, so parts of this is from my interview, but this is from an actual client meeting that we had. I just changed a few things and it was super helpful. I knew that in blue, they had um, portfolio data, we had HR data, you know, they wanted market data and we would need to geocode the Latin long. So I used shapes in Miro to kind of connect everything. These are just your basic, you know, square, rectangle, circle kind of thing. And you can always add arrows. to like connect to different pieces. So I put some of this together beforehand just to have a foundation to walk through, but any questions I had, I might put in yellow. Or and if we, you know, confirm that that's what we want, you can change it to green. We can add sticky notes to say like, yeah, you know, we're gonna need to tie in market data based on the city so we can see what our, you know, are we above or below market, but we don't have that yet. We need to get third-party data. Um, it's just a good way to, you know, data model. <laughs> um, but my favorite part that I use for Miro is dashboard wireframing. It's awesome. So uh, wireframing is this basically where you want to get maybe low, medium, high fidelity of a draft of what your actual dashboard is going to look like. It's not interactive. It's just a picture so they can uh, see your vision. Um, this is my favorite part, and Miro doesn't have templates out of the box for a wireframe, but Nelson is awesome, and he's developed this that anyone can use. So over here in your toolbar, you have access to templates, and I mean, you there's so much because um, you know Miro is used way for things that are outside of Tableau dashboarding, but to be specific, you can see what's personal and shared. But all you have to do search for Nelson's name. And then you'll have this template that he's created and you can plop it into your dashboard. And what it is, is you've got kind of an outline where maybe you wanna put filters, your KPIs, um, any questions and notes. It also comes with a visual vocabulary. I'm sure you guys are familiar with, um, you know, why would you need to use certain charts for certain things? So sometimes that can be good to reference with your, with the client or team. But what I really love about it is all these sticky notes. You can assign, you know, each person that you know is gonna be a part of the meeting a color and they can drag and drop to wherever, you know, like I wanna filter for country, I wanna filter for city, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really easy to go in here and drop in the things that, you know, that they're gonna to wanna to see. So like we need a KPI for the number of leases. We might need a KPI for, you know, rentable square feet that kind of thing. You start out with a very, it's, this is a great way to start out with a low fidelity wireframe to get metrics, any questions out all in one space. Um, you also have these cards that you can use. You can add stickies underneath them or they pop out and you're able to type like what kind of data sources you want. Uh, so you can always fill that up too. But what's extra cool is Miro has a chart app and this thing is awesome. So it's Mira makes it really easy to on the fly when they say, you know, oh, I want to see my co co countries with leases or with the most leases. You could do a bar chart. Um, again, it's a chart element over here. You click it and you have the options of a pie, bar, or a funnel. And it'll spit out um, an example. You can't change the colors or anything, but then you can also configure it. So I'll do an example. So say we want to, I know the client wants to see leases by um, occupancy. So you click it, you can drag, and then right now it's just a basic chart. You can double click, give it a title. Excuse me. Excuse me, guys. Add the title to it.
Sorry, guys. Can't find the call. But anyway, it makes it really easy to just drag and drop different viz elements that you need on the fly. There's even more handy tools that I love, um, including Miro's wireframe library and their icon finder. So the wireframe library is awesome because it already looks like things that exist in Tableau, like the search menu and drop down feature. So you can click that over here and you've got all these options. I love this one because it looks very similar to Tableau's filter. And you can add that to your wireframe. And the icon finder is similar. It's exactly like um, the icon finder website. Like you saw before, donut chart wasn't an option in Miro's chart, so you can just type in donut chart. And bam. You've got your chart example for your wireframe. Now, this is even cooler. So, oh, hold on, let me back up. So, once you put all that together, you're able to put another version together of a wireframe, your lease agreements globally. Um, this is two boxes, and then we've got text. You've got your wireframe drop downs. And these are all texts and icons. These are the charts that you can click into and change. And then we can you can add images and icons on top of images. It's pretty fantastic. And Mira also makes it easy for mobile. So you can wrap your um, design in a phone layout. Oh, come on. What are you doing? And then click show device. And it looks like you just like you would see in a mobile app. So it's really easy to swap if you're going to use Tableau's um, mobile layout feature to show the team or the client what that would look like. Super cool. Uh, we've had clients really love this feature. So now that we've got our wireframe put together, uh, we need feedback on it. So again, like I would share the mirror link with the team and um, <coughs> sorry. And then people can come in and add notes to things that they want to change. Um, you can add sticky notes like we were looking at before. Maybe we want to add a company logo up here. You can add comments and tag people. So we, we know that we need to use company brand colors, but I may not know the, I may not know what they are, so I can always tag you know the director of marketing or whoever is involved to get us that kind of information. And people can always drag and drop in different things based on feedback. So now that I know we've got a wireframe, we know the data is there. Like I, as the Tableau developer, need to make changes. So I use this personally as just like my own little uh, legend and sticky sticky notes is to kind of color code everything. And so as I look at my wireframe and as I work in Tableau, I go back and forth. Um, any note, question, or action item, I leave in the default yellow color. Um, if I need, if it's just a note about maybe the timeline or deadline, I'll keep that in blue or just kind of extra notes. Um, dark yellow is something I've got in progress. So someone said they wanted to add the detailed market comparison visual. That's taking a little more time to build out. So that's in progress. So it was our top 10. Things in green are completed. And then things in red are like, okay, we wanted it, but now we decided we don't need that. We don't need a filter here. We want something else, um, like a stacked bar. But it's really easy to go in and change these as you're working. So I usually just have two screens, like my Miro over here and my Tableau dashboard over here. And I'm able to incorporate the changes I need. If you want even more control, they have um, overall over the whole project, you can have a Kanban board, which is one of Miro's templates. And you can easily have like your action plan of everything from what you need to do to what's in progress to what's done. And you can easily move these um, 
into different categories so everyone on the project with access to the board can see the status of the whole shebang. Um, okay, I have a little funny here because uh, obviously like I'm about to transition you to something and it's gonna be a fully baked dashboard, but I know that like, as you're working on this, you're gonna have version one, two, three, four, five that look more refined, more detailed. So I just kind of wanted to not take up too much of your time, but what I would normally do is like, each time I have a wireframe, I would just duplicate it in Miro and then make changes to it, duplicate it, add the date, that kind of thing. Um, so let's draw the rest of the dag on out. So now we have version whatever, and you've got your final dashboard with your lease agreements and their global presence, your KPIs, um, your metric selection, your map, your pie charts, that kind of thing. Um, now it's all in one place. You've got the final dashboard. You can link out to that, um, to where it's located. This, for this example, it's in Tableau Public. You can also link to different elements in the mirror board. So, you're looking at this, you're like, wait a minute, is this the right audience? And you just answer the questions that we were initially thinking about. You can click that and it'll take you right back to the frame where you had all that discussion. Um, you can, you know, this one will link to your data source lineage. You can add other important documentation for, you know, data definitions, that kind of thing. You come in here and add what you need to add. So Miro is a great way to, you know, do all that documentation that's all in one place, like I said. But it is, while it's Tableau Lite, I still have some Tableau, I promise. So you've got your mirror all in one place, but your dashboard still might be saved somewhere else. So let's put them together. You can embed this whole mirror board into your Tableau dashboard. All you have to do is click this share button, click the embed. It's, you can set the start area but I'm gonna leave it as is. You copy this embed code. Now I'm just gonna paste it into the mirror board to be easy. And then you wanna copy everything in the hyperlink. Now let's go to Tableau. So here's my Tableau dashboard. I've got my global presence dashboard. We've got a couple other tabs, but we also wanna add this mirror for documentation. So what this is, I've pulled in um, a web object. We just want to edit the URL. Let it load. And voila, you can see the board. And it's fully interactive. <coughs> you can see like where my cursor is and you can move things around here too. And if you have the right permissions, you can edit it as well. Yeah, it's fun. So going back here in our mirror board, I can show you the final product. Jane, I know it's beautiful, but don't cry. By the way, some people say don't believe in magic, but now I do. You guys are sweet. I so love I all these great, I love all these tips because it's, I've been using Miro, but had no clue that you could do all this stuff. Like I would just would not have thought to do this with it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's helped me so much in keeping up with like multiple projects at the same time that kind of thing um if you ever do want to look at this later and maybe not watch the video i do have all of this out on a blog post and you're welcome to use this qr code to access but that's all i got sorry i think i've been sick this week so i'm battling a cold but i can still answer any questions if you guys have them so uh first off jade fantastic stuff uh, I'm just cheering for you to, to get through <laughs> everything. 
You kind of resemble one of the people who's like walked into a room who's allergic with cats and like <laughs> hold it back a little bit. Um, I'm just so emotional so, about this. <laughs> really, the depth of your emotion on this just really speaks to it. But I know. Uh, gosh, when you put Tableau and organization in one world, it's just like beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I, I would just be like super curious as you engage with people who are used to like, hey, let's get together and draw on the whiteboard. Um, do you feel like, can you do all those same things and, and maybe more with this? Like, you know, how, what would you kind of say from a game? Is, is this the game changer that it looks like it is? For me, it is because while I do miss being a person, I'm a seven Enneagram and I like do miss collaborating in, real, in the real world with people. Even when we put stuff on whiteboards, you can't, you have to take pictures of it and it's just hard to like re reference back to it. Um, I feel like you can accomplish the same brainstorming and understanding like in a video chat like this and in Miro. Out of curiosity, Jade, I saw a question. Someone was asking, do you happen to know if there's integration with Tableau Public, like what you were doing before, like embedding the Miro board in, into the dashboard, does that work on Tableau Public? Oh, you were on Tableau Public. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, Jade, you're on mute, but uh, it totally works. And you can have an embed link uh, that is kind of, it'll work forever. Very um, cool. Yeah, people just show up. If they were to go in there, they would just show up as guests. Yep. <clears throat> so yeah, thank you guys. That was incredible. And one of the questions in chat was actually the one I had before we went on. Um, Christina asked about it being similar to Mural and what about, because I've worked with Mural, but not Miro. And, and so just if somebody wasn't looking at chat, that they're paying attention to this. Um, the, the overwhelming response that you guys had was you compared them, you did your research, you um, read some blog posts and said, well, when working with Tableau, that Miro was the better choice. Yeah. That was, I mean, we evaluated them for like, I don't know, a couple of days and uh, this one was cheaper, uh, had more mm -hmm. integration and it, um, it has a really strong community. Uh, and so I think we see this one show up a lot more uh, with different uh, clients and opportunities and so forth. So we've not really revisited the conversation. Uh, they're similar platforms. They, they're designed to do similar things, but we find this to just be super simple. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, the learning curve was really easy for me. And I did everything in this board I did in Miro, except for the tablet dashboard, obviously, but it was super handy. Jade, I was, I'm curious. So you're, you're our Miro master. Um, I'm curious, you know, when you publish a dashboard, we all know that the first version, it's not going to be the final version, right? So I'd love for you to just demonstrate how you would start a meeting to then get feedback on a published dashboard to take it from V1 to V2. So what I would do, I mean, I can show you guys. Um, if you've got a published dashboard, what I typically do is I just take a screenshot of the dashboard that we're talking about, go back to my mirror board, we'll put it in the wireframe section, and you can paste it in here. And now you've got like what the client's seeing and you can add to it. <laughs> nice, and I know you're fighting through the, the cold, but I, another thing I've seen you do is you'll create a frame that's dated. Uh, we'll take screenshots of the people that attended the call. You know, there's, there's a ton of stuff you can do. Yeah, I love this. Yep, and so what I'll do, like when I was talking about the iterations before, I'll kind of just, oh, thanks, Nelson. <laughs> I will um, basically duplicate this and then change the date and keep going um, as it goes farther and farther. And normally this isn't a screenshot, like it's all of the different pieces in your dashboard and like elements. So you can use it just like Figma in that way if y'all are used to using that. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Christina asked, how do we find more stuff on Miro's community and other helpful resources? Uh, 
Um, I haven't looked too much, or I will sign on, but they do have videos, um, and I think like training courses you can take, they have a YouTube channel. Um, even in the templates, like you can see, you can preview it and use it, and maybe, and sometimes they have little videos to show you how they work. Um, I think sometimes too, there's like notifications that'll just pop up. I don't know where those are, but I mean like, hey, this is new, try this template out, check this out. You can embed Miro into Teams meetings, all kinds of stuff. I mean, Miro itself is pretty powerful, but I know this is a Tableau user group, so I didn't want to get too uh, Miro crazy. <laughs> well, and Jade, hit that template thing one more time, because yeah. in there you have the community, which I think is about two thirds of the way down to so the community template. It's called the Miroverse, right? And so mm -hmm. you've got some really uh, complex, beautiful things that people use for UX design and for. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, facilitation of meetings and you can do uh, agile retrospectives. Like it's, there's so much that you can do in here. Uh, so it's super cool to, to see all this stuff. Mm -hmm. They make it easy. <laughs> cool. Great job, Jade. That was awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I got a little sick there for a second. <laughs> You did fantastic. That was so entertaining. And there were so many questions. Go go back and read through the chat when <laughs> when you're done, Jade, because okay. that was that I don't know if we've had so many comments on chat before. Oh, yay. Well, thanks. Love you guys. I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Thanks, Jade. Yeah. Jade. All right. I believe we are about to jump into Kahoot here. Um with my co-host, uh, Zach Efron over here in um, Colorado. <laughs> He's just gonna laugh. I'm gonna call him that from now on. So and um, <laughs> let me make sure I'm sharing the right sound here. Yeah, so guys, uh, what's on the line here for Kahoot is a $30 gift card to the Tableau store, uh, which I've actually won another user groups uh, Kahoot in the past. and. I bought a nice little data hoodie. It was awesome. But you too could be the proud owner of a data t-shirt, hoodie, backpack, whatever you want. Y'all see my screen? Yes, we do. And we're hearing okay, the music. Okay, good. I hear the music. It's a little loud for me. I can't hear myself. Thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. So you know All right, the drill. Here's the deal. If you've never done this before. Yeah. What you're going to do is go to kahoot.it or if you are a pro, you probably have the app on your phone already and you know how to do this. What you're going to do is enter this game pin and then you're going to come in as um, well. You can use your name. Uh, just make sure it's a family friendly name. This is a family game. And <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, we, we want to make sure we know who you are at the end of the game. If you're a winner, there is a $30 gift card, as he said, to the Tableau gift card. So, gift, gift store, gift store. So you're going to have to make sure that we know who you are and give, me, give us an email address at the end if you're a winner. I've been eating a leftover salad from last night, and which includes um, meats on sticks. Yes, this is my salad. And... Um, so just don't mind me while I'm eating lunch. And I'm sure the rest of you are eating lunch and joining us too. That's over salad right. from last night does not sound very good. Well, okay. It's a Greek <laughs> salad, actually. It was a Greek salad with kebab. So. Nice. Highly recommend um, Euro Village. If you've ever been, it's like right there. Marietta Roswell line on a sandy plains and 92 you want a good really good Greek salad i'm still like i like this background music i'm digging it it's jamming all right there's only 27 out of the 70 of you guys i mean we've got some good questions okay. in here and I do, at the end, there is one, so there's eight questions. We're gonna get started here in just a second. One question at the end though, after the eighth question, there is a fun poll question. So fun. Nobody's reviewed it for me today, so I, I may have made some mistakes. I'm just kidding. And I took all the liberties since nobody was checking my work. Oh no, I took a look. 
Oh, you saw the whole thing? Okay, okay. Yeah, I might have well, done some Easter did. eggs. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Thinking, I hope I didn't misspell anything. <laughs> All right, let's, um, let's give you about 30 more seconds. You can always jump back in um, if you uh, decide you wanna want to participate in the middle of it. We need to get started. Let's roll. Let's do this thing. All right, I'm gonna hit start. Game time is go. on. Welcome. This is so fun. All right, this is a fill in the blank. Viron, I have iron. I can't talk today. Iron Biz is the world's largest. I got some Comic fun book pictures competition. for you. The picture is to tell you it's homemaking. Uh, <laughs> okay. Iron Biz. I almost changed that to cooking. Looks like that. That's a everybody. I'm. I'm really proud of y'all. This is going well so far oh, yes. we might have a whole bunch of winners let's here. see who was the fastest finger though james that would e. be james james e because the speed right, matters e. is it james e or james e i'll go with james e. true or false the top iron biz prize includes 10 grand cash money true or false that Jeff. that's awesome is it 10 or is it five or is it 20 i don't know maybe they know True or false here. Get to see if you know. Maybe it's nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. There we go. It's it is ten thousand. I wasn't gonna confuse on this one. I wanted to make sure everyone knew it. So this is Kahoot. If you haven't noticed, is informative as well as fun. Which one of these is not a possible interpretation of the French word tableau? So there's actually several <laughs> interpretations. One of these is the, only one of these is wrong. Oui, oui, ha, ha, ha. Table. <laughs> Wait, so it's a word that means multiple things? It does. And um, in New Orleans, there is a tableau restaurant. A few of us went there um, when we were there for uh, for conference. Yeah. yeah, so it can mean a table um, or a picture or a painting. So it's all these different things. So that that's why I was saying the restaurant, I think their interpretation was table. And which is interesting because we're working with tables and we're we're turning tables into pictures in Tableau. Brilliant, right? Cool. All right, Will. Good job. Let's see. We got four out of nine. All oh, right. Is this feature new in 2021.4? I don't know. Copy What's and it? paste dashboard objects. By the you know, way, you I, can't uh I'll fix it. So the only thing you can't copy, you can't copy and paste sheets. And if your container has a sheet, you can't. So there's still some little things you can't do. Mm. This is one of those features that we've all been kind of like, why is this not already a feature? Yeah. So this definitely helps when you have a text or image you want to duplicate and you've already done all the things you want to do and you want to format it the same. All right, James, James, e. James, e. James, e. claiming his rightful spot at the top. Which of these right. is a way to prep for the Iron Biz feeder competition? So this is something that you can do to prep to get a spot in the Iron Biz. So these are also tips and tricks for you. If you didn't know, you're about to know. I actually learned this yesterday. Oh, really? And this is yeah. also a Sarah Bartlett thing, I believe, right? That's Iron right, Quest. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great yeah, way so to this get is to yeah, so Sarah Bartlett, if you just search Google for Iron Quest Tableau, uh, Sarah Bartlett does this monthly thing to help you kind of like work on your chops and align those with the rubric for grading. Um, Iron Viz, there you go. Awesome. So, Jamesy's holding Jamesy his own right there. Strong. All right, we're moving over to, because Jade presented, by the way, and she lives in South Carolina. That's she why does. we're going some James, I'm sorry, excuse me, some Jade questions. Yeah, so that South Carolina flag, you know, they're proud of that thing. You've all seen it as bumper Every, stickers. Because everybody <laughs> who's ever been to South, through South Carolina gets one. Yeah, oh, so they say, palm tree and a crescent moon. 
it's a it's a beautiful flag. Probably it is. I, I love the simplicity of it. Ooh, Christina, look at you. Knew that one, huh? All right. Next up, another South Carolina I meant oops, state question, I should say. <laughs> but the picture should be a hint. Yeah, is it, it George? You ever saw House of Cards um on on Netflix? He makes a big deal about <laughs> that picture right there. <laughs> So South yes. Carolina actually produces the most peaches. I even gave it away. <laughs> I think so. Um, even though the Beebs gets his peaches down in Georgia, South Carolina produces like almost twice as many. And, and California that, actually produces like four times as many. Uh, I left them off because I wanted the answer to be South Carolina. Oh, okay. Wow. That's interesting. That picture, by the way, was the one you see on I-85 in Daphne. It looks like a butt. It does look like a butt, which is why the whole... <laughs> episode of House of Cards was about oh, was. somebody getting in an accident because they were texting someone saying that looks like what? That's hilarious. All right, we're going to talk about Paul now and he's coming up here. He was an A-Tug leader during which year or years? He's an OG. Mm -hmm. He's someone to recognize here. So chill too, and I think he talk, he talks a little bit like Sean Connery. Nice to listen. To <laughs> wow, a lot of you guys knew that. That's awesome. Yeah, good. All right, last one. I didn't mean to click through that so fast. Um, so this is a poll. UGA, go dog. I'm an alumna. I don't know about you guys who likes UGA. So I figured instead of making it about me and my school, I figured, what do you think? Glory, glory to old Georgia. Oh yeah, more people. I figured there'd be a several of you saying meh. And then, um, and nobody said they went to school there and had no idea. Well, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> no one said that. <laughs> uh, All right, let's see who um, is our winner here. Oh. Nikki is third. Let's get, all, like I said, we need your email address at the end. James E. Matthew I'm calling and it. James E. We had some, job, a lot of switches there for the end, but so if you're first, second, or third, can we get your email address? Yeah, hit us up in the chat yeah, and we'll get chat. you hooked up. All right, well then let me go ahead and stop sharing. I have to say good dogs one more time. Being from Athens, <laughs> I am from Athens. I grew up in Athens. My dad grew up in Athens and I went to UGA. So I can't not love the dog. All right, um, here we go. We're getting ready for for Paul. Karen, I didn't know if you're gonna jump in here. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, well, we sort of already have introduced Paul. He needs no introduction. Paul, feel free to pull up your screen. Um, Paul works for Tableau, like I said earlier, and um, like we had in the Kahoot quiz, was an ATUG leader several years back, um, but went to work for Tableau. And today we'll be speaking to us about date calculations in Tableau. I'll let you have the floor. Thank you, ma'am. I want to make sure, can you see my, is my... Um... I can see it. Okay, so my Tableau date calcs is mm -hmm. up. Once it again, is. I want to I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Nelson, Karen, Anna, um, um, Nathan for making this happen and asking me to um, inviting me to participate in today's um, A Tug event. Um, I also want to help my um, at, or, 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 or thank my wife Jennifer, who runs a lot of behind the scenes with A Tug now and um, and getting this going for me. So thanks thanks Jen for letting me um, for letting me speak. Um, I should mention too. Um, we have probably the longest running tug leader um, that was running um, the Atlanta A tug for a number, a number of years. I believe he was one of the original four back way back in 2009. Um, Andy Piper is um, also in the house, and I just wanted to give a shout out to him. I'm going to go off a of video, but stay on. Um, audio, and hopefully I haven't messed anything up, but I can't see myself um, and, and present at the same time. So with all that said, I want to talk a little bit today about some date calcs and 
how we can um, think through this, especially I usually give this type of presentation late in the year in December, and you'll see um, the reason why in just a moment. Um, but it was something that was a frustration for me, um, a frustration for some of the staff that, um, that I worked with at times. And I am, I just want to make sure, I want to go ahead and drop something in the chat, if I may. Um, and so that you don't have to just, you know, take notes or anything like that. Um, all this is already on Tableau Public, so just sit back, have a good time, don't worry about um, the calculations, you can come back to it a little bit later. So, a little bit about me. Um, as mentioned, I was um, uh, a tug leader, but most importantly, I was one of the fi uh, first 30. And you can see this picture here, a much thinner version of myself um, way back in 2009, um, when, when something, um, when we started this, this community, and it was a, lo a lot of fun. I was addicted to it. I, I absolutely love Tableau. Um, and went from working from a small municipal, um, which was about a $50 million a year municipal, to a much larger company called Old Castle, um, which was a $2.5 billion company. Still not, not a huge company, but to put that in perspective, um, they, they, were, they were generating revenue in the tune of $50 million a day, um, where I had been used to um, using um, or having a, with a company that only was 50, 50 million a year. Um, my, here's my wife, Jennifer, um, our, our, our family way back when, when you could still get out and hopefully um, um, COVID subsides this spring and we will have an opportunity to have a lot of these meetings in, um, in, in face to face. Um, this is me that you can see here's um, Andy Piper, um, who was the, one of the original four tug, um, leaders um, were speaking here at a conference, and you might know that gentleman um, as the very first CEO of Tableau, Christian Chabot. So a long history, love the, absolutely love the product, absolutely love the people um, that I work with. I also should mention that I have a, an, we have another Tableau um, customer success manager that's on the line or on, the, on, on this call as well, Vanessa Joyce. Um, she is a colleague of mine and she too is um, just kind of tuning in, seeing, getting ideas from ATUG because in my view, it's probably the best. It's the first um, and the best TUG. Um, it's always entertaining and I always learn something new. So I do want to mention what you are about to see here are true stories. A lot of it is airing dirty laundry. I do blur out um, people's names to protect the innocent so that um, nobody comes back to me and says, hey, I saw that you're using one of my screenshots. Um, and so, but it is all true. And I just want to kind of kind of set, you know, level set that. Um, so about the data. So I am connecting to a little data set that I've created. Um, just to show you that, I, you know, there's no um, fullery or anything. It's about 2.2 2 um, million rows, not very large by any extent, um, but I did want to kind of level set that. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the data source. I am using a, a kind of a, a version of Superstore data that I've trimmed down. However, I've connected it to a fiscal calendar. And what I want to mention is that there are you know, multitudes of fiscal calendars. Some people start their fiscal year in, in February, have a couple of customers that start kind of mid-year. But I wanted to go with something that was a little bit more um, complex. And this fiscal calendar is about the most complex that I am aware of. And it's used a lot in manufacturing. It's called a 445 calendar. And it is um, used in manufacturing because you can then take any week in the current year and fiscal year and look backwards and see relatively um, at a, approximate the same 
week in time. So manufacturers love it. And what is a 445? Basically, and, and it's important because in retail and, and in, um, in manufacturing, you see this quite frequently. So if you're looking for a potential position, if you have some under working knowledge of a 445, that's something to speak to. A fiscal calendar still consists of, or a fiscal quarter still consists of three months. So that's nothing changed there. However, what does what is a little wonky is that you have a four week, four week, five week, and then it starts over again, four week, four week, five week. Um, and so that is the significance of a four, four, five. It, it, they, we, we build them together. So you might be in February, but actually be in a January fiscal month um, or a first, first month of the year. Um, ours was a little bit more complex. So, um, I came from a company called Old Castle. Each week had five days. So once again, a four, four, five um, week or month, but each week had five days. So how did we, um, how did we basically, um, you know, determine what Saturday and Sunday, um, if we had any sales? Saturday, actually rolled back into Friday and Sunday sales actually rolled into Monday. So that was the that was our month and that is what this calendar, this 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 fiscal calendar does that I replicated. And so if you have a calendar that of that complexity, typically then you're going to need some type of table that tells you, that tells the system, that tells your data, all right, although we are, you know, um, January 20th, 2022, what does that equate to, to the fiscal calendar? And you can see it's very, very simple. It's just a real easy, um, real easy table that I've linked by just the date, by the actual calendar date. And then the calendar date um, is joined so that it equates to what week I'm in, what month I'm in, um, and where I am within the fiscal within the fiscal calendar. That is how most of um, the companies that I work with um, as a customer success manager. That's how they deal with that. Um, if it's something more simple with simply moving a month forward, um, then they might they might use you know a, a much a, sim a much simpler way of, of creating that 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 connection but because this was complex we needed that side table per se to know what um, what day what calendar day was and what the fiscal calendar was so that is a little bit about the uh, the little bit of background I'm going to open up with a question and um, if the, I don't have the chat open, so maybe Nathan or whomever is monitoring chat can um, just make, you know, kind of see what, what, what the audience thinks. But my question is, what's wrong with these calculations? Now, this is from a previous presentation that I did, so I don't have 2022 in there. But let's just pretend we're, for the moment, that we're in the latter part of 2021. You can see fiscal revenue prior year is the uh, fiscal year is 2020, then revenue and then this is the current year calculation. If fiscal year um, equals 2021, then revenue. So basically two different calculations. One is calculating for the current year. The other one is calculating for the prior year. Anybody, anybody see any, any potential issues with that? So Brian says, requires you to update both calcs when the year changes over. Oh my God! Yes, we have a winner. Let if he, I tell you what, if we can, and that was relatively quick. If um, if we can get his email address, I will one up you and offer him a fifty dollar gift certificate, um, to the Tableau store, because that is exactly what happens. Is that and and this is the problem. You come back and literally, and this is a this is a live screen that I'm or a a, a, a photo of a live screen. Um, from one analyst, I think it was way back in 2016, I was long before the word COE um, was created, um, I was in essence in charge of, of double checking everyone's um, visualizations before they were published to make sure they adhered to you know, best practices um, you know, from, from a speed and performance um, perspective from a branding and visualization perspective. And so I came back one um, after, you know, after the holidays one year and 
this gentleman had to go back and modify 15 visualizations that had used static, um, static years to calculate current year and prior year. Not fun at all. What's even worse was that I had a couple of members um, that overlooked some visualizations that they had. And so those static, um, those static calculations went unnoticed for almost into July. Um, so you have to then monitor you know, each workbook. You have to remember which workbook is using those static calculations. Not fun, not something that you look forward to at the turn of the year that you then have to come back and, and, and think through, I've got to change all of these workbooks, which is a manual process, and then I've got to um, I've got to republish. So that is not the way to do it. So how do we, how can we compensate for that? And I'm going to show you some of the things that, that I did and, and just to, and, but, and, and sometimes I'll be honest with you, this was, and this was in the days long before level of detail calculations, level of detail calculations made this so much easier. I'm going to show you how we compensated for that. Um, before I begin, I'm also, and I'm, I'm kind of passionate, you'll, you'll, you'll see that I'm passionate about calculations, um, but I'm also probably more passionate about the speed of your calculations. And I want you to think every time, whether you're connecting to a data set that's got 20, 50 rows or has 20 or 50 million um, rows of data, you always want to think about performance. and what I want to stress is if you if you use Tableau well and are using Tableau, especially date um, calculations in the way that you would use numeric calculations, that is going to be much faster than using Tableau with string calculations. Because when you're using string calculations or when you're filtering string um, fields, it is a byte by byte comparison. And there's no way to do that fast. That's not a Tableau issue. That's just, that's just a computer issue. It's a processing issue. However, when you're, calcul when you're comparing dates to other dates or using integer values, um, they run much quicker because they are comparing on a bit level basis. Boolean is probably, well, is the fastest. So you're going to see I create a lot of calculations in that way. So let's move on. Let's get into the nitty gritty of this. Once again, make use of the public. Don't feel as though you have to, you have to you know, watch this and write anything down. So the first thing I wanna show you is the way, that we, the way that we used a current year calculation. And basically it was a Boolean that said, is current year? And how did we do this? Well, our database was updated every morning for the previous day. So there were no future dates. If you had future dates, you'd have to compensate for that. But we knew that the data that once it was refreshed was, to, was always going to be as of yesterday. Now, in some instances, yesterday, if it was a Sunday, may not we may not have had any fails on a Sunday. So what this does is tells us what is the current year based on the fixed maximum fiscal year within the data set. And the reason that this is important is this level of detail calculation, because where people get tripped up is they try to just do a max on, on the data itself and what happens is then they, they enact a filter or they enable a filter, and all of a sudden that max changes based on what they filtered. As we all know, unless you're, you, you're using a data source filter, this is going to work um, before your quick filters are enabled. So this is saying is current year, is the first call year, the maximum within the data set. We do the same thing with prior year because once you have, and I, that's always a start, that's always my start. And so 
From that, if I have my current year, I can go in and do the same thing with previous years. So normally we did year over year comparisons. This is going to work even if you're doing a three year or five year comparison, you're just getting the top five. Um, you're just programming checking to see what is my max date, knowing that the max date is always going to be updated through yesterday in our case, and this will get you the right value. So what I have then based on those two is I can then create current revenue. And all I say is now that I have my Boolean, I said, if it's current year, then revenue, if it's, and if it's previous year, then I'm going to um, get the revenue. So I love this because this always drives people. I'm just gonna get, gonna do this real quick, bam. Um, and I'm gonna reverse the order. So this now shows me the revenue for prior year and the current year revenue. This always set salesmen. When I first showed them this, and we were one of the very first probably back in 2014, long before the word explorer or creator, um, we were using web authoring. So one of my jobs was once I curated a data set, I went around the country training salesmen production um, on how to use Tableau web authoring. And the salesman really went up in arms um, when you first showed them this viz, because obviously they were very proud of where they would be um, at any point in the year. This is, of course, showing a full year of 2021, and only what? We're in the first 20 days of 2022, and so this is really not a good comparison, and they would be, they would be the first ones in the audience to, that stand up and go, wait a minute, there's something wrong there, and absolutely there is. So what about year to date and prior year? Once again, I create two Booleans that handle it. I did this a little bit differently, and I'm going to show you why in just a moment. Um, and the first thing I need to know is um, if I'm going to just show you the, the data. So I'm going to first pull in the invoice date. Just give me a moment to do this. And then I'm going to show you the fiscal date just to show you how this all kind of plays out here there. And I'll go down to the bottom and we'll talk a little bit about what we've seen here. So the way that a, this, this 445 plays out though, is even though today or yesterday was um, January 19th, it was the third day or the 13th day of the first month in our fiscal year. So I just want to kind of set, level set that. Um, as to you know where we are in the fiscal year. And to be honest, we never really spoke to calendar dates. We always spoke to fiscal dates. We always, we always wanted to know where we were in fiscal January per se. We didn't care that. And you can see here that January, um, the invoice date actually started here on January 2nd. We just cared about the fiscal date. So with that said, what dates are considered year to date? Well, obviously, I need to know anything that is month, month, day, day in the current year. Anything that is anything that is above that, for instance, obviously, if I go back here to um, to the to January of 2021, you'll see that. I only care if I'm looking at year over year comparisons, I would only care about going to the 13th day of the fiscal month. So how do we do that? Well, I create an is fiscal year to date calculation. And this is a little bit um, wonky when you first look at it, but it makes perfect sense. Basically I'm taking, and I'm doing this all in, on an integer math basis so that I am able to compare not, um, not dates, but I'm actually able to compare integer values, which is even going to run faster. I take my fiscal month and I multiply it by 100. 
What that does is, for instance, if it's, and I'll just, I'll just tack on here, if it's January, I don't want 120, okay, or in this case, 113, which is the fiscal month and day, because when I compare that to, say, um, 1213, it's not going to not going to show correctly. I actually need to compare 0113 time or 0113 to another entry to another month month day day. And the way that I do that is I just multiply it by 100. I then tack on the fiscal day and I make sure that that is less than or equal to what I am considered to be the last, the, the, the greatest date, which was once again, the fiscal date maximum and the fiscal date maximum day. So let's see how that all works out. If I pull in just is fiscal year to date, I'm just gonna pull that in here. You can see now that going down here, I have a, a flag that tells me, all right, from one, one, this is fiscal date speaking, from January 1st, 2022, all the way to 113, which is a fiscal date, are in my year to date fiscal period. That is true. If I go all the way back up to 2021, you can see once again, here, the same thing, all the way from fiscal date, January 1st, 2021, all the way down to Jan fiscal January, 13th day in January is set to true. If I go back even farther on 2020, because I'm only now comparing month and day, it's going to work going backwards all the way really to the beginning of time, or in this case, to the beginning of my data set. Why is that important? Because sometimes I don't care just about year over year. Sometimes I want to see this year compared to last year compared to the year prior or even farther back in time. So let's do that. I'm going to take and I'm going to bring in revenue. I'm going to bring in fiscal date. Okay, I am going to change the marks here just to be a little bit better um, to bars. And now, once again, this is where the salesman would say, well, wait a minute, that's an unfair comparison. I want to see, you know, I want to see where I am in this point in time compared to where I was the same point in time um, last year. I just pull that into filters, set it to true, hit OK. And now I can see in 2022, I'm rocking and rolling. I'm, I'm, I'm looking real good in the first 13 days of the fiscal month. So that's number one. Number two, and I, 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 have, to, I have to preface this. When I asked this question, this was before we had some functionality in Tableau, because some of these calculations go back a pretty good um, period of time. And so it's... It, the what the what we did to make this work it would um, it worked in the time, but it was not something that we were very proud of going forward. And let me make this a little bit bigger. Can anybody tell me just by looking at that beast what that calculation might be doing? And once again, Nathan, if you can let me know in chat. It took us a while to develop this too. Okay, this might have people stumped, except maybe the Zen masters that are on. So the, the one thing that I suggest when I have a string of, of a date add calculation like this, I kind of work, my, I, I kind of read it from right to left instead of from left to right. And basically, it's saying, give me the today's date, give me the date part of, of that day, of, of the weekday of today, subtract one, subtract that all by a minus, and give me the weekday. So basically, and this is a big 
calc. This is a, a huge calculation for. Oh, I've got a couple of guesses if you want. Oh, to hear. do you? Okay, go before I hit it. Okay, uh, getting the previous day or time period. Close. Going back yeah. to weekdays. Okay, in that case, that's that's very very close. Basically, what this is doing is always returning the last Sunday. And why is that important in the retail space? Because many people are looking at week over week, and they're not interested in really evaluating this week until their Saturday is done. And so this will always return the most recent Sunday. Let me pull that that bad boy up. Now, this is not the way that I would do it now, um, but this is the way that we did it back in the day, um, back before the calculation um, came to be that I'm about to show you next. That is all to say is that you want to constantly review your calculations. A, I know sometimes it's real easy to say it works. It's not pretty, um, but it works. The problem with this is the readability is not that great. And granted, I should have probably um, at the time um, put some a comment section up there. Um, and but the re from from a readability standpoint. And so if somebody comes in behind you to try to a figure out what's going on, um, it's going to be very very difficult. Um, but that was a very close guess. The the best way now to do this, and this was long before we had such a beast is just to simply use the date trunk. Basically, that date, that date calculation, that long string that I originally had was finding the first Sunday. And that was, I think, probably two or three years before um, we had the ability to use date trunk. Obviously, now, if somebody comes in and sees the simplicity of that, they can say, oh my gosh, yeah, why, didn't, why weren't you doing that before? Well, because we didn't have it available to us when we first started running that, that visualization. And you can see they're both identical, except obviously the date trunk makes it a whole lot easier. One of the things that I see often, and, and un, unfortunately, um, I, say, I say unfortunately, fortunately, we at Tableau have made great strides in, in essence, sometimes rewarding bad behavior. Um, because originally, um, I used to show this and, and do all kinds of performance recording, and you, can, you could see it. Um, you could really see the difference in speed. You won't be able to see that difference in speed um, with the calculation I'm about to show you um, unless you're running tens or hundreds of millions of rows of data. And that's the frustrating thing is that you will have a dashboard that works well with, you know, 100,000, 200, half a million rows of data, and then you convert it to, you either productionalize it and you're pointing to a much larger data set and you go, why all of a sudden is it so much slower than, um, than when I was pointing to, you know, just a, a smaller data set. And I see this, unfortunately, all the time. I'm just going to pull it out and you'll see it runs very, very fast. But this is not the way that I would, would, would recommend writing this calculation. Basically, and once again, you'll see this, um, you'll see this even still on this day on Tableau blogs, and it kind of makes me cringe. What, what this fiscal date calculation here is doing, let me get a little bit burger so you can see, is it's taking the fiscal month, creating a string of the fiscal month, then a, a, um, appending a forward slash, and then another string of the date, um, and then another slash, and then the fiscal year. In other words, you're converting the entire portions because the way that this data set is laid out is it shows you month, day, year, you convert it into a string, and then you use the date calculation to make that a true date. The problem with that is that's going to run very quick, probably up to a million rows, um, and maybe even a little bit beyond. But when you get into the hundreds of millions of rows, you are going to see an issue with that. Um, I'm being told to watch my time. I want to do that. And in the essence of time, I want to give um, um, 
just a, one more hint as far as what I suggest with sales. Once again, all of this is on Tableau Public. It's on the link. Um, but I wanted to just give you one other thought. I was in Washington, D.C. about to present. Someone says, hey, the, there's something wrong with this dashboard. Don't know what it is, but the numbers don't write, don't look right. And that's sure enough, I looked in the history. Um, one of the updates to extract did not take place. You want to get in the habit of somewhere within the dashboard articulating what is this data showing me and through what date. So once again, I use that level of detail, max calculation saying, no matter how I have this potential dashboard filtered, it is up, it is, it was last updated with data from 119, which is correct, the previous day um, as an invoice date. And that answers a lot of questions. So I would encourage you to, um, to always have that either as a tool tip um, or actually put it in within the title. And of course, that's very easy to do um, by just in within the title, um, incorporating a um, your invoice date, the maximum LOD calculation. So with that said, I think I'm pretty close to time. Is there any questions or is there anything I can answer? Would love to have um, an opportunity to do so. Either I put people to sleep. Never no, know. that is not it. That is, <laughs> that is not it at all. Sorry, I was trying to like unmute myself. <laughs> right. I'm looking at Q&A and do not see any Q&A. All right, but in the chat, I'm looking through it. Any questions? I think people are just taking all this in. This is, I. you did such a good job explaining this. Um, this is the type of stuff I know for me, like it'll take me like two days sometimes to like really think through, like, I know what I need to do. How do I get this to work? Um, so I'm sure a lot of people struggle with the same stuff, but you have a really good way of explaining it and walking through it. And I'll be honest with you. The last thing you want to do, people generally take those last two weeks off of work. You know, they're, they're with their friends and family the last thing you want to do is is the Sunday night or the Monday night before you go back into work is go, you know, I know things blew up because I didn't have the right date calculations. Now everything is switched over and we've got to figure out all these problems. You don't want, you don't, you know, that that's something that you can almost see. You see a train wreck and it's going in slow motion and you want, you want to be able to in, empower people to fix it right up front so you don't have to, to worry about that in the future. And, and to be honest, it's always scary that people are looking at dashboards that they think are right, but might be looking at previous year data. And, and we've got, I've unfortunately have had many examples of that going on as well. I know exactly what you mean about there's always that fear, like the very, it's January 1st and you're off. I know exactly how that feels. Um, we do have one, I'll ask you one question that I see in here. Someone is asking if you can show the cleanup for fiscal date version one, where you use the string. Absolutely. So here is fiscal date one. This is, once again, you can download this. The, the, and once again, you will see this to this day on many blog posts, just because they're rather old. The way that you should be doing it, that's going to work much, much quicker for you now is just the make day calculation. Now, back in the day, and this is, you look at this and you go, how in the heck did you do all that? Back in the day before make date, this was the way that we did it. It was all math. Once again, if you, if you start from from these long date ad calculations, if you start from right and read left, basically you're taking, you know, one, one, 1900, you're adding the year, you're adding the month, you're adding the day in a numeric format that all went away because now you just can use make date and you've got your date. Thank God for make date. <laughs> oh my Lord. That's true. <laughs> This is awesome. I don't think we have a whole lot of time for any more questions. Do you see, do you guys see any Nelson, Anna, that we can answer quick? I don't no, think so. Awesome. No. 
Thank you so much, Paul. This was my so pleasure. Good. You know, I always, I, I always love a tug. Um, it was something that I, I would, I looked forward to the, that third Thursday of every month. Um, and I know that I still, it pains me that I can't participate like I once could. Um, but I love coming back and, and talk and speaking every once in a while and, and catching very good content that y'all put together. And, and just so y'all know in the chat, there are some links just to subscribe, subscribe to updates to our ATUG dashboard to join us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, all the things, just as we're about to head off. Sorry, Paul, I didn't mean to cut you off. Jen said you did great. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the hard part, isn't it? We <laughs> appreciate yeah. you and Jade. If Jade is still on, thank you so much as well, Jade. Thank you, Jade. You guys, yeah, this was thank great. You guys. And thanks Paul, everyone for being here. I'm going to be here. asking you date questions. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Have Thank a great you all so Thank much. you all for joining us. Thank you. I will see you next month on the 24th. See you all next month. Bye, everybody.